Good afternoon. Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Um, we'd like to thank the Preservation Association of Lincoln for sponsoring today's lecture. Our speaker today is Rob Branting. Rob is a student at, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln studying parks and tourism in hopes of one day directing a museum or a historical park. He is a volunteer at the Strategic Air and Space Museum and he has been running their website since he was 15 years old. Rob's interest in the base began when his parents first started taking him out to Air Park to swim and fish when he was younger. One day his father told him about the lines of bombers that used to crowd the flight line and the missile silo, silo near his father's home in York, Nebraska. Since this time, which was about fourth grade, he has had an interest in the Cold War. His goal is to establish a readily available history of the base in Lincoln residence, of, of the base to Lincoln residents, since there's so little of it in public view. Um, Rob's talk today is titled, A History of the Former Air Force Base, 1942 to 1966. Please join me in welcoming Rob Branting. All right, thank you. Um, as she said, I'm here to speak with you today about the former Lincoln Air Force Base. And at this point in time, I'd like to express my thanks to the University of Nebraska for requiring me to take so many public speaking classes. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, as we see on the board here, um, this is a picture of base operations in the former flight control tower at Lincoln Air Force Base. Both of these structures were uh, built around 1954 to 1955, and the control tower was a standard Air Force design that was implemented uh, throughout the 1950s. It was also about 10 stories tall. Uh, base operations here um, is located near the uh, southeast part of the tarmac. Um, I'm not sure if um, any of you are familiar with um, that area. It's um, close to uh, Duncan Aviation Shop, which is actually just off camera. And this shop actually used to be a former crash uh, station for the Air Force Base. Um, today, all that remains of this site is uh, the parking lot, as you see here, uh, which is utilized by Duncan uh, employees from time to time. But also in the photograph, you can see that um, there is a few squadron operations buildings in the background. Um, this one was recently demolished in 2003. And we also see a building off in the background here. Um, and this was home to the 307th Armament and Electronics Squadron. And this squadron was uh, tasked with, um, well, uh, supporting the armaments and, um, well, the electronics of the warplanes that served at Lincoln. Uh, today, this uh, structure is utilized by Boomer's Printing. We also see in the background, um, kind of distant, uh, some lines of barracks, and these were enlisted men's barracks that existed, um, that were uh, thrown up during the 1950s and um, eventually uh, demolished um, <coughs> between uh, present day and 1966. Um, we also might see uh, Tanker Hill in the background. This is before, um, I believe, uh, some of the northern base housing was constructed. And it received its name from uh, housing a couple of water towers on the top of the hill. And um, there's a story behind that. Uh, just a quick mention here, if anybody's curious about this structure, it was the rotating beacon, um, uh, light beacon that operated for the Air Force Base. All right, moving on. Uh, just a quick background of what Lincoln Air Force Base was all about. It was operated by the Strategi Strategic Air Command, excuse me, um, from 1952 until 1966 in some form or another. Uh, the Strategic Air Command was a major component of the United States Air Force. And during the Cold War, it was tasked with uh, providing America's nuclear deterrent against the Soviet Union. Uh, Lincoln would be noted in the later 1950s as being one of the most, uh, one of the more major SAC bases um, uh, during that time period. Um, as mentioned, it was a medium bomber base operating the B-47E Stratojet uh, bomber. And this was America's first generation jet bomber. Um, essentially, uh, <coughs> crews from the 98th and 307th bomb wings that served at Lincoln uh, came 
directly pretty much from the Korean conflict where they had been uh, flying B-29 Super Fortress bombers. Uh, some of these crews had mentioned uh, going from the B-29, which was a heavy, uh, cumbersome aircraft, to the B-47 was like jumping into a jet fighter plane. Um, how fast the B-47 was at that time, and it actually could outr um, outrun many of America's first jet fighters. Um, we also had uh, the KC-97 Stratotanker. Uh, this aircraft was a predecessor to today's KC-135E Stratotanker. Um, uh, about 40 of these operated at the base at certain times um, during the 1950s and 60s. Uh, was a major um, component in supporting the B-47 stratojet because the B-47 just did not have the range to reach its targets in the Soviet Union uh, without the support of tankers. Uh, Lincoln was also one of the first bases in the nation to uh, support the Atlas F ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Uh, this was one of America's first generation uh, long-range missiles to be uh, fielded. Um, a few others had been uh, previously fielded uh, at places as um, like Offutt or um, in California, but um, uh, Lincoln uh, operated the first uh, silo-based protected missile design. And uh, lastly, uh, from 1960 until about 1966, uh, Lincoln was defended uh, by the Nike Hercules surface-to-air missile, which was an uh, Army-operated um, missile, and two sites were chosen uh, by <coughs> Davy and Crete, Nebraska. We'll go into this a uh, little further later. Nope, yep, wrong button. As we see here, this is uh, one of the more iconic pictures of at Lincoln Air Force Base. And I should note here that um, some of these photos had been provided to me by Mr. Jim Dumlap of Lincoln, who was a major photographer of the base uh, during its time. Uh, we see here the B-47 uh, Stratojet. As I noted, it was a very advanced design. It is still uh, quite an eloquent aircraft. Um, today. Um, we're looking, it's parked behind a KC-97. Uh, as you know, um, little has changed from the refueling practices as uh, with Air National Guard, the, the Nebraska Air National Guard tankers today. Um, essentially, if you look further back, you see the flight line goes quite a while, quite a ways back into the distance. And, um, well, essentially, that is all about that. So I included here a quick uh, map of uh, Cold War uh, Nebraska that were operating around the time uh, that Lincoln Air Force Base was active. Um, you'll note on the screen the Fs uh, representing the Atlas F missile silos that were distributed across eastern Nebraska uh, from 1960 until 1965. The red ends represent Nike uh, Hercules air defense missile sites. Uh, two were chosen uh, by Lincoln, and two more were a position uh, south of Offutt Air Force Base for their protection. Um, also notable are the Atlas D, which were the early, early predecessor uh, Atlas missiles uh, deployed, uh, some of the first in the nation. And while operating uh, from the 549th Strategic Missile Squadron at Offutt Air Force Base, this missile squadron actually ultimately came under the command of the Air Division at Lincoln Air Force Base. We also note uh, just some different things about the state. Um, a couple Atlas E missiles, so Nebra uh, Nebraska was the only state to operate all, uh, every class of Atlas missile. Um, the air defense um, missile sites uh, that tied into a national network at Omaha and Hastings Air Force, sta uh, Air Force Station. Uh, Grand Island Airport was also a supporter of uh, jet interceptors that would uh, be distributed from uh, Kansas City um, in times of crisis. And um, the bees represent a Blue Scout Junior uh, communication rockets, which would be launched in the event of a nuclear attack to ensure uh, communications would not be disrupted um, in the event of war if ground bases had been destroyed. <coughs> Just a quick uh, rundown on the website, um, as she mentioned. Um, it was uh, constructed around the year 2000 when I was 15 years old. It was uh, uh, quite a nice site, <laughs> but it was kind of limited as to what we could display on there due to size limitations. In 2009, uh, the GeoCities uh, domain ultimately uh, 
failed and um, we had to search for a new site very quickly. And today we operate at Lincoln Air for LincolnAFB.org on this new uh, domain and um, we're continually upgrading it. I'll uh, state here too that um, along with the veterans who serve there, the airmen and officers and civilian workers indeed um, who operated at the base, um, much of this work is dedicated towards them, but also uh, to my father who um, died from leukemia in 2007 due to Agent Orange exposure while serving in Vietnam. Okay, to uh, get into a greater history of the field, this is a shot um, of Lincoln Army Airfield as it existed between 1942 and 1945. Um, the base was uh, originally operated as a civilian airport and began uh, in about June of 1930 um, with uh, carrier air mail um, flying into Lincoln. Um, one of the first carriers that flew into Lincoln too as well was United and their service continues today. Um, the field was quickly named Lindbergh Field as Charles Lindbergh uh, utilized Lincoln, uh, some of their flying schools, as to get some initial training and uh, flight school experience uh, well before his uh, historic trip over the Atlantic. Well, um, the base, um, excuse me, the field, the civilian field, uh, originally occupied a 160-acre plot, probably uh, this area, um, until 1941 when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Um, quickly, in February 1942, the Army announced that a new mechanics training school would be built in Lincoln, and this is what you see here. Um, suddenly, that 100 lot was expanded to nearly 3,000 acres to occupy a great portion of uh, the air land northwest of Lincoln. And as we see here, we see a few of the uh, notable structures, the uh, hangars uh, that were constructed, uh, lines of barracks in the background, and also Huskerville. Um, at this time, it was named uh, the base hospital. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman who served here um, and noted that these <laughs> barracks were constructed of wood and tar paper construction. He noted during the winter time um, he would be taking a shower and running back to his uh, barrack uh, with a towel wrapped around his neck and by the time he got back to his barrack the towel had frozen into a U-shape. And days like today we understand, we can definitely believe that story. So. Um, what else happened at uh, the Army Airfield was uh, just well, the mechanics training school, but also um, basic training uh, for the Army Air Forces was brought in towards 1943, I believe, um, from a base in Missouri that had been um, kind of overloaded with uh, recruits for the Army uh, Air Forces. Um, as Lincoln was one of the 11 uh, Army airfields in Nebraska, um, it was more specifically that mechanics uh, school for their operation, for majority of their operation, but also processed um, about 3,500 bomber crews on their ways to the different theater of operations, theaters, excuse me, of operations, either in the Pacific or the Atlantic. Um, a little more about the Huskerville area as we see in the distance here. Um, it was the Army uh, hospital area until 1945 uh, when the uh, Army airfield closed. Um, but from then on, uh, about 1946, the University of Nebraska occupied this land um, to be used as married student housing. By 1952, however, Lincoln Housing Authority had uh, taken over this uh, plot of land and as well as, well, just the area surrounding it. Um, but a notable point was that a polio outbreak uh, occurred there in 1952 and it's uh, one of the more nationally uh, publicized outbreaks as um, two uh, children had died due to it as well as uh, many other uh, uh, injured due to the outbreak. So by December 1945 the war had pretty much <coughs> been over since September. And Can you give us an orientation north, south, east? Right? Oh, I, I apologize, sure. Uh, this would be north, uh, this way, and this way it would be south, and uh, of course this would be westward. Um, it's, it's somewhat taking the shape of what uh, the Army, uh, the Air Force base would take uh, during the 50s and 60s. Um, in this area, Bowling Lake would eventually be constructed on the north end of the base, 
and uh, more barracks in the south end. And this is a little bit further in the future. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, December 1945, the base had been closed. And um, a permanent closure was not, um, would not last for very long. Uh, this is a photograph of um, some airmen, I believe, and a pilot um, in front of a P-51 Mustang of the Nebraska Air National Guard. The 173rd Fighter Squadron was the second um, Air National Guard unit to uh, stand up in the nation, and it operated out of the north hangar of the um, previous Army airfield, as um, I believe in this hangar on the north there. Um, what had happened is that uh, 22 surplus P-51s <laughs> had served with Lincoln until about 1958, until the Air Guard uh, transferred into the P, I'm sorry, uh, by this time it was designated the F-80C shooting star. Um, and this represented a great leap in technology. And it was somewhat rare for Air National Guard units to receive brand new aircraft. Of course, this would be, um, uh, would be uh, taken back in 1950, these aircraft were be federalized due to the outbreak of war in Korea and the need for uh, advanced jet fighters. Uh, the Air National Guard then transitioned back into the F, uh, by this time designated the F-51 Mustang, and mostly served uh, stateside and did not see any action in the Korean conflict. Um, this is another photograph of, um, from Jim Dunlap. Um, and these were the first entries into Naval Air Station Lincoln. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, as I talk among my peers, a uh, few people realize uh, that Lincoln was an Air Force base, but even fewer realize that it was a Naval Air Station due to the fact that we're, of course, so far away from the coast. Here we see a uh, photograph of a P-2 Neptune uh, patrol aircraft that was stationed at Naval Air Station Lincoln. Uh, from 1948 till 1958. Um, we see here it must be uh, probably flying over what would be now Sun Valley Boulevard, and we see a predecessor to the Harris Overpass um, here on O Street and it off its uh, left wing. We're oriented uh, towards the east, uh, looking eastward across Lincoln. And of course, we see downtown in the state capitol in the <coughs> far distance. Uh, the Air, uh, Naval Air Station also operated the F-6F Hellcat, a uh, World War II vintage uh, propeller-driven fighter for some time, until transitioning into the F-9F Cougar a jet fighter, which was a uh, swept-wing, uh, highly advanced design. Um, these aircraft would serve at Naval Air Station Lincoln until 1958, <coughs> when the assets of the uh, station would be uh, shipped to a uh, base in Kansas. Um, what had happened uh, between uh, then and 1958 was that the Air Force base had opened on the west side of the field. And uh, essentially, the Air Force wanted the Air National Guard and the Naval Air Station to relocate their base so that the Air Force could occupy the majority of the property. Um, thus, pr uh, funds were provided in the mid-1950s, uh, more specifically 1956, to uh, build an Air National Guard hangar and a Naval Air Station hangar on the east side of the field. Well, most both uh, structures had been uh, built by 1958. Uh, the Air National Guard utilized a, a smaller hangar, and the Naval Air Station utilized a brick uh, construction hangar. So when the Naval Air Station left, the Air, Air National Guard uh, subsequently occupied the Naval Air Station hangar and uh, facilities, and thus they still remain in that hangar today. The Army National Guard would later uh, occupy the Air National Guard, the first Air National Guard hangar, uh, south of that. So there's a lot of terms being thrown around right now. Um, when Lincoln was an Army airfield and an Air Force base, uh, it was an Army airfield, of course, from 1942 to 1945. The Air Guard came in shortly after in 1946, and the Naval Air Station in 1948. But by 1950, um, the world had changed substantially uh, from the end of World War II. Uh, the Berlin blockade had occurred in 1948, and uh, the Soviets had detonated their first atomic bomb in September 1949. Uh, to cap this, by June of 1950, the Korean War had broke out, and causing uh, one of the Cold War's first hot wars. So what had happened is that defense spending had decreased, uh, had 
increased substantially. And uh, this is following uh, Dwight David Eisenhower's uh, new look policy in which um, much of the defense spending was going into the Strategic Air Command or America's nuclear deterrent. It was thought that um, a strong nuclear deterrent would uh, prevent war altogether and that um, there would be a lesser need for conventional ground forces. So, in 1950, Lincoln City uh, planners uh, saw this as a potential to reactivate the Air Force Base at Lincoln. And after extensive lobbying in Washington and at Strategic Air Command headquarters in Offutt, at Offutt, excuse me, um, the base had been uh, reactivated as soon as October 1952. The first uh, unit there was the 41st 20th Air Base Group, and their task was to um, uh, develop public relations with Lincoln, get pretty much get the ball rolling as far as um, developing new structures and um, maintenance <laughs> of the base. So by April of 1953, Lincoln voters passed a 99-year lease le measure um, to, cons to allow the Air Force to remain essentially permanently at the base as long as they'd wanted. And by early 1954, um, construction was shaping up. Uh, by February of 1954, the 98th Air Base Group had been established and headed by a Lincoln native, uh, Colonel Frank Cather. So this is a breakdown of uh, Lincoln's uh, units in 1955. Uh, the 818th Air Division had been activated in November of 1954 to basically um, support the needs of the two bomb wings at Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln was something of a rarity of SAC bases mm -hmm. uh, nationwide as it supported two bomb wings instead of one. Um, it was noted as being a called a super base for this uh, point. So. Um, well, the 98th Bomb Wing had been established uh, by mid-1954, and the uh, 307th Bomb Wing um, by January of 1955. Both of these wings, as noted, um, th came from the Pacific Theater um, during the Korean War. I believe the 307th came from Okinawa, and the 98th from Kadena Air Base in Japan. Uh, we see also that um, to support the B-47s, uh, they were somewhat short uh, wing, short uh, ranged bombers. Uh, 20 KC-97 uh, tankers would support um, both bomb wings. The only trouble was is that the B-47's top speed was, a l I'm sorry, uh, its stalling speed, which uh, would be the speed to just barely keep it um, in the air was only a little more than the top speed of the KC-97 propeller driven aircraft, so uh, air refueling uh, was a tricky task and would not never uh, be fully uh, solved until the advent of today's uh, KC-135 Stratotanker. We also uh, note 34th Munitions Squadron, which uh, controlled many of the nuclear weapons and um, other uh, weapons at the base. And also the 818th um, <coughs> own squadrons to support um, the basic operations of the base, installations which ran uh, fire uh, fighting units, air police, food services, supply, everything basically needed to run uh, a full-fledged Air Force base that Lincoln <coughs> became. We see here the first B-47 landing at Lincoln, and I believe it was piloted by our, uh, the base commander. Um, as we might note that there's not very much in the background. We're looking east across the tarmac, um, I believe on the northern edge of the base. Uh, no Duncan Aviation, no other general aviation um, assets or uh, facilities at that time, and um, it was a fairly just empty fields. Um, the B-47, uh, was noted, was a, very fa was a fairly fast aircraft for its time. It had a crew of three, a uh, pilot, uh, co-pilot, and in the nose sat a navigator. Um, the co-pilot um, essentially controlled um, it's also its 20-millimeter uh, uh, cannons, uh, defensive cannons, on the tail of the aircraft. And the navigator was essentially in something of a closed-off, uh, dark room. Um, his <coughs> task was to also provide the bombardier mission for the aircraft. And um, in the event of crashes, interestingly enough, uh, the B-47 did have ejection seats uh, with the pilot and co-pilot fi firing upward, but the navigator firing downward. This proved to be a problem when the aircraft would take off, and um, 
from what I heard, the navigator would just try and jump out the side of the aircraft instead of using his ejection seat. Uh, and fortunately, a few um, B-47 crashes did occur at Lincoln, and um, most notably, quite a few of these actually did not happen uh, on takeoff. Should be noted, too, that um, B-47s at Lincoln used JADOs, which were uh, jet-assisted takeoff bottles, which propelled a heavily uh, burdened aircraft, um, provided extra thrust to push that airplane into the air. A notable incident um, in 1964 was uh, the Meeks, uh, Major Meeks incident, when a B-47 commanded by this, uh, I believe at the time he was a Captain Meeks, um, took off, but one of the JADO bottles exploded and ripped through the fusel fuselage. Uh, in an effort to um, take the aircraft up as far as he could, he allowed the other crew members to bail out with promises that he would bail out as well. Unfortunately, the plane was heading downward, and in view in front of the aircraft was a schoolhouse uh, in northwestern Lancaster County. And he decided to uh, take the aircraft on his own control and um, push it away towards an uh, empty field. Uh, posthumously, he did unfortunately die during this incident to uh, avoid hitting the schoolhouse. Um, he was posthumously uh, promoted to uh, major because of this. Here we see la the last of Boeing's uh, KC-97 line um, <coughs> arriving at Lincoln. Um, about 888 of these aircraft were uh, ultimately built, and if somewhat familiar uh, with the B-29 bomber, this was the last of the B-29 subtypes that would uh, be built by Boeing. After this, the, the jet uh, KC-135 tanker would be uh, constructed from 1956 on. Um, it was noted as uh, it was a very uh, useful <coughs> multi-mission aircraft. Um, usually in the bottom uh, were per just permanently a reserve for fuel tanks um, to fuel the bombers and um, other aircraft. And sometimes uh, passengers could fly in the top cabin. And this aircraft was used to ferry um, airmen and officers uh, from Lincoln to uh, bases in either Spain or um, Great Britain or um, I believe at one time even Morocco for um, a forward for their forward basing uh, commitments. We see here um, a shot of the uh, North Hangar today. Um, this was operated by the 98th Bomb Wing, and the South <laughs> Hangar was operated by the 307th Bomb Wing. Um, as we see behind it, no stock hangars were constructed to, um, for the uh, personnel to uh, service the B-47 and KC-97 tankers. Um, while this um, main hangar could support four aircraft at one time, um, it cost about 3.5 to $4.5 million when it was first constructed, but it was <laughs> constructed with um, in mind some of the early um, design studies to prevent uh, structures from falling down after a nuclear uh, blast. Of course, it wasn't totally nuclear resistant, but it was built with earthquake-proof masonry materials. Um, another cold weather fact is that de-icing uh, warming equipment was also uh, provided underneath the doors. And um, essentially, these were the first type of hangars that were built west of the Mississippi River. Uh, they were noted as some of the largest structures built in the United States at the time. Uh, we see here um, a couple of postcard photographs of uh, some different buildings and uh, well, a pool at the base. If anyone's familiar with the Arnold Heights area, uh, this is the Arnold Heights pool today, but at the time it was utilized as an enlisted person's pool. Uh, there was a officer's pool located further north, um, this way, I guess, in the photograph. And, um, it, well, ultimately, this was taken out. Um, other people, I mean, if you're familiar with the areas as well, you might notice uh, this building is now gone. It was the service club for the um, enlisted and uh, non-commissioned officers at the base. Um, when you read through some of the newspaper articles uh, from the Jet Scoop newspaper published by the base, uh, you would see advertisements as um, they'd be offering dances there. Um.
are, I believe, operating there. Um, also, uh, they would televise uh, boxing, and keep in mind this is the 1950s and televisions were quite a new science. Um, just basically a day room recreation area for the base. Uh, we see below the base exchange, which um, was something of a uh, retail store for the base and its uh, neighboring barber shop. Um, there was a base exchange located um, in this picture. It's barely visible above the service club um, in this area. Uh, it remains today. And there was also a flight line uh, base exchange for uh, crew members closer to the uh, flight line. Um, in this picture, we can also see uh, the base chapel. Um, this is different from the World War II vintage uh, chapel that was located further closer to Huskerville. And um, services were provided for all faiths at the base, uh, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish. Um, otherwise, in this picture, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll look at the 1,000 seat theater that was at the base. There was also a commissary closer by um, that, op that featured automatic checking machines, which was something relatively, re relatively revolutionary for the time. Uh, we see a uh, aerial photograph here of base housing. Now, this would be closer to 1964. Um, there is a slight difference in the layout of the housing, as this is 1,000 unit total uh, housing area. Uh, this first first uh, area was constructed in 1954 and I believe was uh, built and um, designed by a Lincoln architect. And they utilized curved linear streets which were pretty innovative at the time. Um, these houses were mainly constructed of uh, wood and um, well it was just in response to the lack of housing in Lincoln in 1954 as this was a major Air Force installation coming in and uh, housing was just not available. So the Air Force constructed these units as quickly as possible. By 1956, it was already realized that these houses were already full, and another section was built um, with a more uniform shape um, and straight streets uh, further north. And this would be, um, like I said, more uniform brick construction houses. And um, we also see uh, Arnold School, named for General Henry Hap Arnold. Uh, who was uh, a major general during World War II. And this is, well, the original school that was just recently vacated, I believe, in um, 2007 or 2008. And, um, well, you see a, a small outline of Huskerville as it existed. And as you can tell, it had been there quite a little bit longer with its more mature uh, landscaping. Um, this is where, of course, Arnold Heights would eventually be built. I'm sorry, excuse me, Arnold School, the new one, would eventually be built. Um, we see just along Northwest 48th Street, looking north, um, the entrance, the main entrance of the base, which has now um, have been paved over, or uh, it's now uh, just not used. Um, and also a photograph of Bowling Lake um, in the far distance. Um, interestingly, um, during the late 1950s, uh, this was remarked as by airmen and officers as Perry's Pond as the commanding officer of the base um, asked uh, airmen and officers in their spare time to pretty much volunteer uh, to dig this lake out. And um, essentially this is what, uh, what off I mean, this is uh, just a major recreation area of the base when it was finally finished. Um, the island in the middle was actually originally occupied by a uh, flock of uh, goats, I believe, to keep the uh, grass down. So uh, they would use speed boats and motor boats. Uh, there was a small beach there as well, and uh, that was kind of a not so much a hallmark of the Strategic Air Command, but um, the Air Force wanted to make sure its crews uh, were, you know, at least uh, provided recreational opportunities um, and during their strenuous duty, especially with the Strategic Air Command. So we'll go here to a a uh, quick layout map of the base as it existed. Uh, we're looking this way is north, um, so, um, towards the tarmac up here is the east. And um, essentially, we're looking at the barracks area for the enlisted personnel um, on this area, on this region. 
Um, in between uh, each barrack, well, not each, every third barrack was a dining hall, and there were, were about five of these that operated at the base. Each of these had um, a different styling effect um, put in. Uh, one had a Paris backdrop, I believe. Another one had an Old West uh, style uh, setup. But also, um, it's just how uh, the Air Force segmented their area, the specific areas to their needs. Um, this would be a warehousing area with the original uh, World War II uh, warehousing that was kept. While all the other barracks and most of the other structures from World War II were torn down due to their uh, relatively temporary nature due to the um, effect of World War II. Towards the center of the base, we have 818th Division Headquarters and the Bomb Wing Headquarters um, located here. Um, while the enlisted men were mostly in this area, um, the officers occupied this area of the base uh, next to Oak <coughs> Creek. Um, this was the officers club and I believe this is the pool and a few uh, officers barracks uh, were there as well. Um, all of this I believe except these are definitely gone. Um, I believe the officers club still remains uh, while these other barracks have been uh, removed. Um, a ba the base supply, of course, yep, was um, up towards this area, and um, we see the, of course, Arnold Heights uh, housing area in this area and towards uh, the west part of the base. Um, this little area here we'll go into, um, it should be a little bit further away than what it indicates on the map as the um, bunker complex for the base that would um, house its weapons. This is a more recent shot of the bunkers. Um, <coughs> on the west side of the bunker complex. Um, original row, going back to the before picture, um, this original small uh, row was constructed in 1954 and the longer area was constructed in 1956. Uh, the main purpose of these uh, bunkers were to house Lincoln's weapons. Um, of course the 20 millimeter uh, tail cannon armament for the B-47s, small arms for um, air policemen at the base, and of course Lincoln's nuclear weapons. Now these bunkers were constructed more for the fact of uh, protecting, uh, well of course the weapons from weather, but um, uh, protecting uh, side areas from being demolished should the bombs go off. Uh, during the 1950s, uh, safety mechanisms for nuclear bombs were relatively new. Um, they weren't quite sure of what would happen if they caught fire. and. Um, well, the main purpose was that uh, to protect the area from the high explosives that encapsulated uh, the main nuclear part of the bomb. And um, of course, this would provide any uh, sort of protection in the case of a nuclear explosion. Uh, we'll go back here and mention uh, the, the, where the name of Bowling Lake actually came from. And it was from uh, Captain Russell Bowling, who was a member of the 98th Bomb Wing, an aircraft commander. And on his way to um, taking his aircraft to, I believe it was Lakenheath Air, Air Base in uh, the United Kingdom, um, his B-47 crashed on landing. Um, it had been loaded with a Mark VI, uh, it's a relatively potent nuclear weapon. And um, unfortunately, the bomber had skidded into another series of igloos full of nuclear weapons. Um, members of the RAF were... Uh, quoted at the time as saying that the whole incident could have turned southeastern England into a desert um, due to the, you know, the danger of what had happened. And, um, well, in, in the, in the um, after, aftermath of this, um, they decided to name the lake after Russell Boeing. And actually, there is a photograph of uh, his widow and the base commander uh, christening the uh, shelter house structure. Um, that was a something of an officer's club, I believe. <coughs> on the north end of the base um, shortly after his death. Well, by 1957, uh, the Cold War had been changing again. Um, we had seen the Suez Crisis of 1956 and the Lebanon Crisis of 1958, um, which uh, put Lincoln on alert, uh, put their bombers on alert um, in case of any surprise attack. Um, but the problem was, in October 1957, the Soviets had launched uh, the Sputnik rocket. Um, defense planners in America realized that if uh, the Russians could launch a satellite into space, they can develop a rocket to um, carry a warhead to the United States. And the problem was, um, 
with uh, Sack's massive bomber force at this time, which numbered probably well over a thousand by this point, um, bombers were very vulnerable now. Instead of a few uh, few hours warning uh, from Soviet to protect against Soviet bombers, um, rockets could uh, be landing in the United States within 30 minutes. So by this time, SAC instituted an alert program, um, and Lincoln was one of the first bases to implement this program, um, to essentially have an alert force, have crewmen uh, sitting on uh, call near the flight line to um, respond to any threat and uh, danger uh, that would be going on at the time. They would race in um, little station wagons or trucks to their bombers on the flight line and would have to get these bombers in the air within 15 minutes. See here an aerial photograph of Lincoln's um, air um, alert force, uh, well, apron. Um, if anyone has flown into Lincoln recently and has, um, or, well, within, since the 1960s, uh, they might have flown in and landed on this runway and might have remarked what these uh, structures were on the side. SAC named these a Christmas tree pattern of just alert pads for each bomber to occupy so that um, these bombers could get as airborne as quickly as possible instead of um, being parked on the flight line and having to taxi through the other rows of bombers to get to the runway. Uh, Lincoln was a unique case. At, they decided just to close the northwest to southeast runway and um, as noted by this X here, um, an X meaning you, it's not no longer a usable runway, and just to turn it into an alert apron, where at other so, uh, SAC bases they decided to build a new alert apron. But at Lincoln, because of the U.S. Uh, Highway 34 um, drive so close um, to the end of the runway, they decided they couldn't do this. Um, well, from here, uh, they decided to build a mole hole, and Lincoln had one of the larger, um, what was called, um, remarked as a mole hole, um, semi-underground protected uh, structure that um, alert crews would um, sleep and uh, watch TV or read magazines in just to pass the time over their 24-hour alert period. And, um, well, they would have to do this, of course, for 24 hours until um, going on to other missions and duties. Um, we see here these black dots probably representing the cars on the alert force um, to get to their bombers as quickly as possible. Um, this made uh, America's bomber uh, nuclear defensive uh, nuclear deterrent a lot more um, survivable in the face of the uh, Russians uh, developing rockets. So by August 1962, uh, we see a change in Sachs' overall um, uh, mindset, essentially, um, that they were going more towards a mixed uh, bomber and missile force, where they were originally uh, just a bomber force. Um, subsequently, uh, the 18th Air Division was renamed the Strategic Aerospace Division in, uh, due to the added mission of the Strategic Missile Squadron, as I'll talk about uh, a little later. Um, of course, the B-47s uh, would remain at Lincoln. Um, the air refueling uh, squadron would remain at the 98th, but the 307th lost theirs in 1960 when it was decided that uh, propeller-driven aircraft would be better utilized further north along strike routes uh, by B-47s headed to the Soviet Union instead of these uh, slower propeller-driven you know, aircraft um, trying to keep up with these jet bombers. The 307th did uh, pick up another uh, squadron, however. It was the 4362nd originally support squadron, but was uh, eventually renamed the post-attack command and control squadron. This squadron operated 15 specially modified B-47s that would be uh, put airborne in the event of a nuclear attack, and uh, essentially they were uh, flying radio relay stations. Um, there were four squadrons strategically located throughout the uh, nation, and uh, Lincoln operated uh, the central um, portion of these. Of course, the 38, 34th remained at Lincoln with its uh, bomb mission. But uh, some of the names had changed uh, also to represent the change in uh, <coughs> SAC policy with the mixed uh, force. Uh, installations became civil engineering. Uh, police became combat security squadron, and um, the air base squadron became a combat support squadron. These were just uh, 
quick, uh, not quick, that just uh, just name changes pretty much only. Uh, the missions fairly pretty much remain the same. We see here a photograph of uh, Atlas F missile silo construction occurring in southeastern Nebraska. Um, if I would take a guess, this might be the site near Beatrice or um, Wilbur. And uh, these silos were about 80 foot deep in size and um, well they were reinforced with uh, rebar and heavy uh, well, thick concrete to protect against nuclear blasts. Um, the original Atlas missiles were um, either encased, one was called a coffin method, which was employed around Offutt Air Force Base, uh, which protected it, uh, which offered virtually no protection for the missile. Uh, the E uh, provided, um, the E model variant uh, provided against 25 pounds per square inch overpressure, while the Atlas F provided um, 100 pounds uh, per square inch overpressure in the event of a nuclear blast. Uh, to put things in perspective, I believe the human tolerance for pounds per square inch is three or four. So this is a very reinforced um, silo. Um, let's see. The silo was, uh, the silos were dug out towards 1960. And, um, well, they were, uh, excuse me. They were um, constructed towards 1960 and uh, consisted of a silo and a launch control center in which five men would occupy uh, for a 24-hour uh, period. And, um, well, the problem with the silos, um, excuse me, let me find this in my notes. There we go. Uh, about 1,900 workers worked on these silos of the 12 of them around Lincoln uh, on 24-hour-a-day shift, oh, not on, for them, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week due to the urgency and attention of the Cold War at this time. Um, these were, as I believe I mentioned before, the first actual missile silos ever built and preceded today's um, Minuteman Missile Force. Um, these were essentially uh, learning by uh, construction and um, Essentially, what they did later on was make those missiles much smaller and um, a lot easier to handle. Unfortunately, seven workers did die in the construction of all um, 12 sites. Uh, the last being a uh, air policeman uh, guarding the Palmyra site, and uh, unfortunately, a tornado uh, ripped through the site in 1961, I believe. Uh, 33 labor strikes occurred during construction, and um, the engineers had troubles constructing the silos initially due to the sandy soils and which kept caving in. Uh, we see here a couple photographs of the Atlas F missile. Um, this was taken from a Lincoln uh, Air Force Base guide of a, si a missile being shipped to one of its silos in um, <coughs> eastern Nebraska. Of course, we see the capital in the background, but um, these events uh, were fairly uh, common, uh, you, they would see missile silos being shipped down O Street every so often to the three sites in Easter, on US 34 in um, eastern Nebraska. Uh, they were well protected with air policemen um, and um, essentially they were very fragile missiles as um, in comparison to today's. Uh, here we see a uh, Atlas F um, loaded um, on a propellant loading exercise um, out of its silo with um, the, I believe these are one or five ton, excuse me, uh, blast doors that would protect it underground. Um, I mentioned <coughs> propellant loading exercises because um, unlike today's missiles, which could be uh, easily, not easily, but just quickly fired from their silos, the Atlas have had to be propped up and um, a dangerous mix of chemicals to make it um, fly had to be um, put in. Uh, the thickness of the skin of this missile was no thicker than a dime in some places and uh, was essentially propped up like a balloon. Um, inside, uh, nitrogen gas was uh, utilized to keep the missile's shape, uh, but when it came time to fire, uh, the nitrogen was quickly pumped out and um, a mixture of liquid oxygen would fill one tank and uh, another mixture of a kerosene-like substance the other. Um, these were both, of course, very volatile um, mixtures of uh, fuel and um, 
about three occasions at silos in uh, Texas and Oklahoma, the missile actually exploded on its stand due to um, mishandling of the uh, liquid oxygen. At the Eagle site of um, one of the Atlas F missiles assigned to Lincoln, um, there was an incident when the missile was being propped up into its silo that it uh, caved in on itself like a pop can, essentially. Um, the mountings uh, came loose, and the warhead essentially just uh, pushed the missile in on itself. Um, they did this, they made it uh, thin skinned so to get maximum range to reach its targets from Lincoln to uh, and points of the Soviet Union, Union excuse me. But um, these missiles would not remain on alert very long due to their dangerous uh, nature. Uh, quick quick uh, advents in missile technology uh, was occurring by the time these missiles were actually deployed and the, um, its successor, the Minuteman missile, uh, which remains in service today, um, ultimately replaced the Atlas F. So by the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Lincoln was at full strength. Um, its B-47 force, um, under the uh, code name Operation Clutch Pedal, was um, much of it dispersed to civilian airfields across the country. Um, one, I believe, was Chicago O'Hare. Um, of course, when the time when it was a lot less uh, busy than it is today. Um, New Hampshire, I believe, and a site in Wisconsin. Um, in October 1962, the Atlas F missiles were um, just fairly brand new. Um, they had just gone on alert um, in the previous months, and um, what had happened is that crews would be on alert for days at a time due to the lack of qualified missile uh, technicians. So they were quite tired after this uh, crisis was over. Um, just an interesting note um, in a book uh, that was that mentioned Lincoln and Offutt during 1963 was a civil defense book named Strategy for Survival, and it essentially uh, marked out you know if you were this certain size of city, if you had this type of air base, if you had these style of missiles, uh, this is what kind of uh, punishment you should re you would probably receive if there was a nuclear attack. Um, they marked Lincoln for 65 megatons and quite enough to ruin anyone's weekend. Um, in comparison, the Hiroshima bomb was about 13.5 kilotons, so about 13,500 uh, tons and compared to 65 million tons of TNT equivalent. Um, whereas Offutt was only uh, targeted for uh, 50 megatons uh, due to their, uh, I guess it was because we had stronger missile silos than Offutt did. Um, but really, this kind of uh, was representative of the paranoia that was going on at the time. I mean, who was really ahead in the arms race was it was the United States. We had a 10 to 1 uh, nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union. And at times, uh, Lincoln's entire complement of bombers uh, made up a substantial fraction of the entire Soviet bomber air force. So um, this is uh, just what was going on at the time. Um, of course, Lincoln, uh, we found that uh, they carried the Mark VI uh, nuclear bomb, um, which was an improved, uh, um, improved version that was uh, dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. But um, by 19, the late 1950s and early 1960s, they had progressed to uh, thermonuclear weapons, which were, of course, much larger. Uh, the Mark 36 had a yield of 9 megatons, of course, here, uh, noted as 667 times the strength of Hiroshima. And the W-38 warhead uh, mounted above the uh, Atlas F missile had a yield of three megatons. Um, it's hard to imagine the, uh, ex the in intense amount of explosive power that was stationed at Lincoln uh, during the uh, or late 1950s and early uh, 1960s. Um, we'll mention here uh, quickly the Nike Hercules defensive missile. Uh, this is what it looked like. Um, on its one of its launchers um, in eastern Nebraska. Well, this was not a picture of eastern Nebraska. I believe it was at, um, in Texas. Um, but uh, this, the pictures uh, on the side uh, show uh, um, Nike uh, Hercules uh, missile site in eastern Nebraska today. Uh, these were the first in the nation uh, mounted above ground, as um, these rockets were also um, provi uh, positioned around cities for their protection, but uh, were mounted on elevators. Um, Whereas at Lincoln and other SAC bases, it was decided just to um, put earthen berms around them and uh, park them on concrete. 
Each site had 12 missiles apiece, and um, they either had a high explosive warhead or also a, a small nuclear warhead to take down oncoming Soviet bombers. Um, well, essentially, these sites were constructed in late 1959, and the 6th Missile Battalion, 43rd Artillery, was tasked to protect the Lincoln and Offutt um, Air Force Base areas. Um, their headquarters was at Offutt Air Force, um, excuse me, Omaha Air Force Station in the north part of Omaha. And these sites remained active uh, until the, the final uh, doors were closed at Lincoln Air Force Base. So by June of 1965, things were starting to uh, um, get uh, slow down, I guess. Um, in November of 1964, uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara decided that Lincoln would be one of 95 uh, U.S. bases worldwide to close down. And um, so by June of 1965, most <coughs> of the wings and uh, many of the squadrons had already been deactivated. Uh, March 1965, uh, the 818th Air Division, uh, one of the higher echelon um, commanding uh, force structures, was uh, deactivated, along with it the 307th Bomb Wing. Uh, later, the 307th Bomb Wing would be reactivated in Thailand until its deactivation in 1976. And as of January 2010, <coughs> it has uh, now been reactivated as a bomb wing at uh, Barksdale Air Force Base uh, uh, as a wing of B-52 bombers. Um, the 90th Bomb Wing hung in there until the end of uh, operations. Um, it was redesignated a Strategic Aerospace Wing when it took control of the 551st Strategic Missile Squadron. Um, at this point, people in Lincoln believed because of the missiles, um, the base would remain open until 1968, but um, as Robert McNamara stated, that it, it would close by uh, June of 1966. Um, from here, just to mention some of the wing, some of the squadrons that actually had been along with the 98th and 307th from uh, their inception, armament electronic to um, support those needs of the aircraft, a field maintenance, which was more uh, more intense uh, maintenance of the aircraft and repair, organizational uh, consisting of mainly crew chiefs and day-to-day -day maintenance of the bombers and uh, tankers, and a headquarters squadron for administrative purposes. Uh, this is the, one of the more iconic photographs of the base. This is the base commander in December of 1965 saluting the last B-47 to take off from Lincoln. Um, essentially, the bot, this had been exactly one, uh, 11 years since the first B-47 landed at Lincoln and was part of an uh, operation to uh, deactivate the B-47 as quickly as possible. Um, while it had represented the forefront of technology in the early 1950s. Um, by 1965, it would become obsolete. Um, of course, uh, a notable uh, side effect of the B-47 was its smoky um, takeoff. Um, it would be interesting to see how the EPA would <laughs> note this aircraft today. Um, but other um, main, the other main points of the B-47 deactivating was its thin wing. Uh, it could not handle the stresses of low-level flight very well, and that's what the new mission uh, was going on for um, Strategic Air Command and the Bomber Deterrent Force. Um, but also, um, things uh, there is less reliance, less money going into the Strategic Air Command and the Nuclear Deterrent Force when it was decided that. Uh, conventional forces did, in fact, have a role to play in uh, you, um, oncoming uh, wars, including the war in Vietnam, which was already going on at this point in time. So by uh, June uh, 25th, 1966, the 98th Bomb Wing officially closed the doors at Lincoln, and a uh, smaller uh, operation had uh, taken control from the 98th and lasted until about January of 1967. At that point, a lease uh, lasted until 1968, but um, essentially the Air Force was handing over the property fairly quickly to the Airport Authority in the city of Lincoln. Um, it had gone from a complement of 6,500 men and women uh, serving at the base in 1964 to no more than 431 by uh, 1966. Um, from that point on, um, the Air Force closed the doors and that was the end of Lincoln Air Force Base in Lincoln. So. so.